Never neutral. You can never afford to be neutral. My brother and sister in Christ, you know what I like about Ed? Is man, that guy is all in. I, th I truly believe Ed's got two motors. Go and faster. I don't believe ha he has anything to do with pumping the brakes. I don't even think there's a neutral in his car. Ed believes in one thing, only thing. He is disciplined. He is driven. He is focused. He's either all in or he's all out. The year's about, man, I don't know, about 1960, 1970s. Ed is uh, probably, he'll tell you, one of three children. He'll tell you that his, uh, his parents are great. They own a little shop. They do okay. They make ends meet. And his dad does a little side work, does a little newspaper work, a little this, a little that. He said, now look, we didn't make a lot of money, Ed will tell you, but the money that we did, we did okay. He said, now football, that's his game. And as a result of it, man, he was good at it. Disciplined, focused, driven, all in. Man, that's it. He's actually the captain of the team. Gets a scholarship to Columbia. Well, by the time he finishes senior year, he gets that scholarship, and he's about to go to spring practice. He pulls the dad on the side. He says, you know, I've been thinking. He said, I think I may want to do theater work. He said, I've always wanted to at least give it a try. And he said, son, let me tell you something. You can do whatever you want to do, but you're either in or you're out. Son, you can't be neutral on this because if you're going to play football, then play football. If you want to go acting, it's two totally different roads. Whatever you do, get it out of neutral. He decides, goes all the way to Oklahoma City to get in the show, if you will, Oklahoma. He does pretty well, i got to tell you. If you've ever seen parts of it, i got to tell you, it looks like he was a, a master of the arts before it even started. Man, next thing you know, he's decided that he wants to go ahead and get, in, get into TV shows. He gets into the shows like Barnaby Jones, Y'all have heard of that, haven't you? Okay. You can always tell where everybody, what age everybody is. Because Barnaby Jones in high school, they just look at you like, well, what's the point? My friend's in Christ. He goes to Barnaby Jones, does Bonanza. He does gun smoke. And he's making his meat, but he's got to tell you, he said, he said, man, I had to keep other day jobs. I'm not making it. He calls his dad. He said, look, I'm not real sure if I should stay in acting or maybe jump to the movies. He said, son, remember what I told you. You either in or you're out. You want to do movies, that's great, but you're not neutral. Get it and move. Put it in gear. He meets Clint Eastwood. He gets in a movie, and I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Absolute Power. It's fantastic. Eastwood plays a jewel thief, and Ed plays the sheriff trying to catch him. And I got to tell you, it opened the door for Ed like there's, like there's no tomorrow. He gets in a movie called Coma. He gets in another one called A Beautiful Mind. He gets in another one called Enemy at the Gate. He's in National Treasure. You know, I didn't memorize a thousand of these things, y'all. I just picked some that I thought everybody would recognize. He was, um, he was in Alcatraz, The Rock. He was in Apollo 13. Do y'all know who Ed Harris is, my brother and sister in Christ? Okay, well, look him up. But let me tell you, that's what the guy had. He's never neutral. That is that gospel. You can't be neutral with our Savior Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene gets up early to go to the tomb. Why? Because she'd rather be near a dead Savior than live people. And if she doesn't go, then she can't get the others to go. No, my brother says, Christ, no, stop. This is what you need to understand. You are a first century Jew. And as a result, you know things that most do not. When Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, she knows that there is going to be a rock in the way she cannot move. She knows there will be soldiers in the way that probably had their way with her. It's also been sealed by wax with the stamp of Pilate himself. So she knows that the chances of seeing anything are pretty minimal. The harassment is quite great. But yet, she is never neutral. She is all in, whether he's, quote, dead or alive. Now she goes gets Peter and John. Tell me John doesn't show reverence to Peter. He gets to the tomb and stops and allows Peter to go in first, even waiting for him to come. Remember, Peter's always listed first. Peter's the only one to get his name changed. Peter's the one with the keys. Peter's the one that been, I told you was scripted almost 180 times. Listen, my brother and sister in Christ, for Peter to show up, and this is what they see. They see the shroud in one part, and they see the death mask in another part of the tomb. Please remember this. On the crucifix, the good Lord makes a powerful statement. He says, I commend my spirit to God, which means he gave up his spirit. That means death can't enter till he says so. So if he wished to remain on the cross for another hour, another day, another week, another 10 years or 1,000 years, death waits till he is loudest. 
My brother's Christ, for somebody to move the death mask from one spot near the shroud, which was his body cloth, around over on the other side of the room, somebody had to walk it over there. Case in point, Lazarus. When he gets to the tomb of Lazarus, my brother in Christ, does he yell, Lazarus, come out or come out? Man, God bless you. That's correct. Because if he says, come out, and doesn't call him by name, then every tomb opens and everybody comes out. It's the second coming. When Lazarus comes out, they used to bind their hands and feet as a Jewish rite, a burial, which means you can't walk out. So how does Lazarus get out of the tomb? That's the miracle behind the miracle. This is the point of the death mass being moved. Only Christ could do it. My brother in Christ, throughout Scripture, our best players are the ones that were never neutral. Mary Magdalene, the first to see the risen Christ, with all seven deadly sins, pride, anger, gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, and envy, but yet the first to see the risen Christ. You know what's amazing? According to our tradition, according to our tradition, Peter confronted the Lord. Lord, I'm your vicar. You gave me my keys. You changed my name. You put me the head of your church. Why did you appear to her and not to me? He said, you know, when I looked for you, Peter, I couldn't find you. My brother in Christ, she was never neutral. Isn't it amazing that everybody who's tied to the crucifixion in an indirect or direct way was never neutral? Case in point, Longinus. Here's a guy that is the centurion. Pilate has no way of controlling Jerusalem without this guy. And as a result of it, man, he is the centurion centurion. Everybody wants to work with him. Everybody wants to be around him. Everybody respects him. Because when there was trouble, Longinus is your man. And as a result of it, he is the one that stands and says, truly, that man was the son of God. My brother says, Christ, his 401k is a 201k. He leaves within the week of being a centurion. And a year later is beheaded by the same men that helped, that helped him with the crucifixion. And according to tradition, he came to him and they finally caught up with him. Pilate sent him to go get, get him and to behead him. And when they caught him, they asked him, look, we'll just tell Pilate we couldn't find you. He said, oh, no, you don't. You're not going to be neutral on this. You either are a follower of him or you are not. They beheaded him. My brother and sister Christ, Arimathea, Nicodemus. Both of those men within months left the city. Why? Because you can't be a Pharisee now saying the guy we crucified was the Messiah. Well, now here we sit. Oh, and by the way, everybody who remained neutral to Jesus Christ, everybody who judged Christ, Herod the Great, Herod that followed his grandson or his son, Pilate and Judas, everybody who judged Christ and tried to remain neutral all took their own lives. Well, now here we sit 2,000 years later. My brother and sister Christ, are you and I neutral? Let me see. My brother and sister Christ, remember this. You're either walking towards him or you're walking away from him. You are never neutral to him. Your emails, your text messages, your Facebook, the way you drive your car, the way you respond to people, the way you respond in your car. My brother and Christ, let me ask you, if the good Lord was to read our text messages, our emails, our little things that we write, the way we go about our business, how would he respond? Would he look at the text message and say, truly, truly, that's a, that's a child of mine. Look, look at what, how, how well she responded. Look how well he responded. When everybody was spitting on him and belittling him and condemning him, look how he responded in my life. Or would he look at it and say, who are you? Depart from me. I do not know your name. My brothers in Christ, remember this. How you respond in a conversation. How you respond in an email or text message at work, driving, going to, going to work, going to go grocery shopping, how you sit with friends and have coffee. How you speak is a reflection on him. Remember St. Paul's words to you and me. You will stand before me and I will judge you everything you did with your body, both good and evil. My brother and sister Christ, there are no mulligans. On the very nanosecond that you and I pass, we will be judged. There is no negotiations, arbitration, or mediation. That's why i got to get you to understand you are never neutral. My brother and sister in Christ, are you neutral about your faith? Did you go to the same masses last year that you're going to this year? You're neutral. You went the same amount of times you went to confession last year, you're going to this year? You're neutral. You're backing up. You can't be neutral. You're either moving towards him or away from him. If you go to the same number of masses, the same number of confessions, 
the same number of adorations you went to last year that you're going to this year? Well, let me tell you, you're going backwards, and you're ultimately going to fail. Let me ask you, when they turn to you and say, let us pray, will you break out the sign of the cross clearly and distinctly? Or are you going to say, well, I don't want to offend the people here, but we have no problem offending him. If you're in a group that doesn't necessarily believe in the sign of the cross, for they think that you are blessing yourselves, you're asking God to bless you, by the way. My brother and sister in Christ, are you willing to make the sign of the cross? And if they ask you to pray, you're going to break out the Hail Mary? Or are you just going to say, oh, man, whoa, no, no, I ain't going there, Father. I mean, my brother and sister in Christ, are you willing to let people know you're Catholic? Stop apologizing for being Catholic. Oh, my God. I mean, where do we draw the line now? I mean, you simply are just going to say, well, Lord, I just didn't want to offend anybody. For 15, 1,600 years, you're either Jew or you're Catholic. Christian means you believe Christ. How you worshiped him is the delineation. Catholic means according to the whole. If you and I gather in one place, we read the scriptures, we sing psalms, and we break bread, you're no longer Jew but Catholic. So why are you and I apologizing now? My brother's Christ, when somebody gets in your car, will they know you're a good Catholic? They drive by your house, do they know you're a good Catholic? They go in your house, do they know you're a good Catholic? Did you put that statue in the front yard? Or did you put it in the back so nobody can see? My brother and sister in Christ, how do you vote for people? You vote based on because, man, I got to tell you, he's got a great economic policy. Well, how's that abortion thing working? Well, I got to tell you, everybody has their rights. Well, let me tell you, my brother and sister in Christ, the good Lord has spoken to this. He said it's a commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Period. There is no asterisk. There's no mediation. My brother in Christ, do you honestly believe that the good Lord's going to bless our economic policy while we kill his children? My brother in Christ, think about what he's telling you. When he asked me, where are my children, Father? Well, I got to tell you, I get you. But this guy's got an economic policy. I got diplomacy. Whoa, I got to tell you. He's going to say, I'm supply and demand. My brother and sister in Christ, you got to stop apologizing. You are never neutral to him. Mark Twain is right. If there's a fence between heaven and hell, it's owned by the devil himself. I don't care if you're tired and exhausted. You want to have a pity party? Go have it. You're through? Get in the game. Because you came in on this day, you're going home on this day. Our time is short. Look at the world in which we live. How much more convincing will it take that we're in trouble? You can't afford to worry about everybody else. Keep care of your vineyard. Stop being neutral. Man, even the snails made it to the ark. You got to persevere. You got to get up and get in the game. Man, I'm sorry. Man, Father, if I pray one more time, I'm going to spit. Spit. Now get in the game and finish what we started. You don't have to win the race, but you darn sure better finish it. You are never neutral. My brother and sister in Christ, I leave you with the words of Mother Teresa. She said you can do things two ways. You can either do it right or you can do it again. You're never neutral. Amen. 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 There you go. That's a good Easter crowd. God bless you. Please stand now that I warm myself out.